This is Eric Rutan of Cannibal Corpse. You are listening to the Scars and Guitars podcast with Andrew McKay-Smith. Greetings all and welcome to the show. Have I got a magnificent conversation to share with you on this particular installment of the Scars and Guitars podcast because it features Thomas Harkey from Meshuga, the Swedish maestros. The conversation comes about due to the launch of a new album from the lads titled Immutable. Now, if you're listening via the podcast apps that are out there, Apple and Spotify and God knows how many others, we're going to play a tune. It is titled Ligature Marks and there's a reason for that which you'll hear deeper into the conversation. If you've tuned in via YouTube, we're going to cut to the conversation with Thomas right now. Either way, let's go. Mate, how's the, uh, how's the conversations been going around this, uh, around this album here? Because uh, I, I did listen into a couple of the interviews and it seems like as though you're, uh, I don't know whether people have been listening to the album before they've been talking to you, but I suspect some of them haven't been. I think that's definitely the case. I know that we did have like one um, thing where where a lot of uh, press people were invited to listen to the album, but it was only like a one night thing, one listen type of thing. Mm. Uh, so I, I I do think that a lot of people that I that we have been talking to have not necessarily heard the whole thing, but more just bits and pieces and whatever the singles that are out, you know. Oh, okay. All right. Okay. Fair enough. Yeah. Well, no, I, I got sent a copy. Was it last week or thereabouts? So I've lived with it for at least uh, maybe five days now or so, which I thought was important to do because, you know, you, the band does have such a great history, but it is the new bloody album and there's an opportunity to talk about it. And I think new material is really important for even a great band like you guys. I appreciate that, man. You know, so, uh, what have I got lined up for you in terms of questions then after all of that? Look, the, the new album, it, it is called Immutable. And and uh, look, I'm an old fan and I find that it's subtly different to a lot of your material to date, which I, I'm enjoying, I've got to say, because I, I feel like as though you've done what I would describe as a bare metal respray on the band's sound, you've stripped it back a little bit to the nuts and bolts. Would you agree? Yeah, to a certain degree, for sure. I I think, uh, I mean, obviously with the, maybe, you know, with Violent Sleep of Reason, we were going for something that we felt like at the time. And if you take songs like uh, Clockworks and Nostrum and some stuff on there, it's really kind of erratic sounding, kind of pulling and tugging at you as a listener. Whereas I think this one, it wasn't even deliberate, but I, I we did realize after the fact that all songs have backbeat on the drums. It's like yeah. we've never released an album that, that that's been all backbeat through and through. So that combined with, you know, there you take one person like Frederick out of the band or, or out of the out of the studio and production and mixing process to a great deal. Mm. Uh, that also has a direct effect because then other voices are heard more and stuff like that. So they, there's all sorts of reasons why why you, you you're going to end up with a slightly different album. I mean, first of all, you have also just the fact that we're older now, and it's been six mm. years since since uh, Violent Sleep of Reason, and and we do change constantly as people and as as musicians and what we kind of like to hear in ourselves and what we're kind of going for. And that, that goes for any, anything from like the, the song material and the riffing themselves, but more, maybe even more when it comes to like tailoring your guitar tone, your bass tone, like uh, stuff like that. So, so there's a lot of things that, that combine, they make for, for something that's, going to obviously have an effect on on how a new album comes out you know for sure and mm. and and yeah so i i do feel that it's it's different in a lot of ways and maybe a little less young if you will in the sense that you're in a point in time and in our careers where we, we're not trying to impress anyone other than ourselves and we really mm. don't have anything to prove uh, I, I'm not saying we had anything to prove on the last album either, but of course, slowly over time, you kind of grow more and more into like something else. And you do care more about, 
each track and you do tend to write more for the track and 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 you're a little more um yeah you just tend to like really kind of do to you try your best to do the best with each track and 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 to to make it kind of pop and make it into something yeah. that you think that you first of all you ha it has to pass the bar of us as a band and that we like it but then you also it's all of course always in the back of your mind that mm, i think yeah i i think people will like this too i hope so and that's all you can really do at, at the end of the day you know yeah look i think Old fans, people like me that have been around since Chaos Fear, thereabouts, you know, sort of 97, 98, we're going to find a lot to like about this one. Um, you, you know, you're never a band that throws curveballs, so to speak, in terms of you're not going to sort of alter the band's sound by taking it into a different quadrant of the compass, so to speak, and doing something completely out of the box, if you like. No, no, no exactly. No, you're yeah. right. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. <laughs> you know, um, but I, I, something else I'd say, I feel like as though that um, there's a conscious, it, it sounds as though there's been a conscious effort to make the songs more musical, as in there were some moments where I found myself humming the groove later, such as the, the groove under the solo in They Move Below. Did you, do you think that's the case, that there was a, more an effort to make it a bit more musical, a bit more memorable in that respect? I think uh, I don't know if we ever could could ever be that precise about what we're trying to do uh, and and say we want it to sound more musical or sound sound more this or that. I will say that I I do find that it came out maybe sound a, a little more orchestral in places and when you take like the layers of melodies of guitars and if you go back a few albums we never really used to do that. We always kind of stuck with what was doable on five people live on stage so mm. you would normally only have one lead on the guitar and you wouldn't do harmonies on those and we, for the last uh, with violent sleep we kind of started like not caring so much about that and maybe even more on this one that that gives you a certain vibe too because you may have like four different harmonies on the on a guitar melody on top of what's going on under, underneath and that gives it kind of that you you sometimes even take away the 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 feel of is this necessarily a guitar or is this a synth or what am i really mm -hmm. hearing so you have kind of aspects like that and and uh when, when you say that uh, whether it, it's caring about the, the musicality of, of the music, if you will. I think that's, again, like that just kind of, this is what happened this time around. This is how the songs came out. And it, it's not necessarily something that, that we sit and, and have necessarily a, a good check on ourselves, what we're really doing. It's just like, this is the music that came out uh because of the times we're in because of who we are as people uh you know in 2021 when we wrote this or in 2020 and 2021 and 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 that's just kind of what happens you know yeah yeah gotcha yep now um as i said i've had the album for four or five days a bit longer maybe but um so far ligature marks that's the tune that stands out it's it's just such a slow, you know, awesome, slow, menacing monster. The polyrhythms that you've got there just sound impossible to remember. I don't know how you do what you do, I've got to say. But w was that the tune that was amongst the hardest to get right? No, I wouldn't say so. It was actually once, uh, once we kind of started rehearsing it, it just fell into place. But it is a there's a funny story about it because that this song almost did not end up on the album uh mm -hmm. this was something that we the last week of rehearsal when every we already decided on all the songs on the album and like one week away from us going down to the like packing everything up and going to the studio uh morton is playing this thing in his room where he's like kind of working on songs and stuff and it's ligature marks and like dude what what the hell is this? Like, what, you, what is this gem you've been hiding from us? It's like, oh, I don't know if it's ready. Like, oh, okay, but uh, for God's sakes, play it, you know? And he played it, and it was like, this, it was already exactly the format and the shape that it came out on the album. So it was already done. And I'm like, 
man, what are you thinking? This is this song is so fucking awesome. This has to be in there. And he was like, oh, okay. I, yeah, I guess. We, yeah, I guess it's kind of cool. It's like, what do you mean kind of cool? And actually, I'm, I'm so stoked about that because it, to me, just like for you, it's not going to be the same for everyone, obviously. But to me, it ended up being probably the strongest track on the album. And it's, if not, if not that, then it's at least the one that kind of just, it just gets in your brain and it kind of stays 100%. there. You know? So well, I, I'm saying, stoked to hear you say that about that track, because it's, it's definitely like one of those that really kind of sealed the deal for me, you know, when it comes to the, the material. Yeah. I, I'm on exactly the same page. I was listening to it in the car and I had, I got to say, I dropped the kids off to school and it was on and I couldn't really listen to it properly when the kids are in the car because you know all the yelling and shit that goes on. And um, <laughs> <laughs> I got back in and I thought, I'm going to listen to that song from the beginning. And I actually sat in the school car park and I listened to it and I thought, I reckon that's among some of the finest tunes you guys have ever put together, which which is really saying something. So, but it, so it begs the question then, why didn't the label think of releasing that one as a single? Actually, this was a this was a debate, uh, I think, uh, between uh, not so much us, but between like people on the label. I know Marcus Steiger. Uh, this was the first one when we uh, played the album from the first time, which was the first master. This would have been in August. Hmm. Uh, then we went back and started remixing the whole thing and then remastered mastered it again and so on. But when he heard the album the first time, this was actually one of the tracks that to him also was like, Oh my God, it's driving me insane. Ligature marks. And he yes. had like, it was ligature marks and God, he sees in mirrors and, and, um, um, I don't remember if I think it was a kaleidoscope or, or, or one of the other one, no, light the shortening fuse or kaleidoscope, but those mm -hmm. were like his four favorites. But I think he ligature marks even for him was like, that was like, he loved it. So then it was more a decision making kind of process. And at that point we didn't know which ones we wanted to make videos for and which ones are we going to like release as singles and such. And, but, but yes, in retrospect, it's like, yeah, we should, we should have definitely put that yeah. out as a single, you know, but there we go. There people go. get to hear it tonight or tomorrow. So mm -hmm. I, I hope, I hope more people are like us and stoked about that song because I love it. Yeah. I think old fans will get it. They'll, they'll, they'll hear that one and go, Oh shit, that's the banger. That's the I, one. I think so. Yeah. 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 You mentioned Marcus and, and, uh, and atomic fire there. Was it the decision to move from nuclear to atomic fire? Was that, and was that an obvious decision for you? In other words, was, was, was there more on the table from atomic fire compared to what uh, nuclear blasts are putting on the table? No, it was not. It was not a, it was not an easy decision necessarily. I mean, we never wanted to break with Marcus because Marcus has been with us since for our whole careers. You mm -hmm. know, he he contacted the band before I even joined the band in 1989. And we signed with Nuclear Blast and with him in 1990. So it's it was kind of almost unfathomable or like no we can't like we, we don't want to split with marcus but we didn't like uh being put in the middle of this as we were and we really drew we dragged it out forever for as long as we possibly could to not make a a decision you know, to go this or that way because we were kind of just waiting to see how it was all going to pan out because there were so many changes happening with believe kind of buying nuclear blast and a bunch mm -hmm. of people staying with nuclear blast and a bunch of people leaving and 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 marcus kind of you know doing his own thing which is you know for good and bad he started a new label which is exciting i think for all the people that he did bring with him and for him too but it's also like this is like one of the first releases ever on that new label so everything is kind of ooh, a, a little bit up in the air and everything is not like necessarily like as ordered as it as it has been previous you know with, with where you have people that have been working with you for like 15 years or more mm -hmm. but but yeah we we also had a very close re, uh, working relationship with the with the nuka blast la office and they they have people there that really helped us with with so many things over the years from from uh you know merch designs to uh, tour poster designs to all sorts of stuff uh, so we did have a very close relationship with them. And it, to us, it was really uh, uh, 
a bummer that we ultimately had to go with with this or that you know and and at the end of the day it's it's loyalty you know i even though like uh in la for example so you have gerardo martinez we've been working with him uh since he was a kid basically i mean we worked with him for i don't know 17 years or something like that mm. so so um yeah it was it was a tough decision and and it was not one that we ever wanted to have to make but at, at the end of the day it's, it's you know marcus had been there throughout through and through and he, he's always like carried the flag real high for Meshuga. He it's always been one of his favorite bands and you know that's at the end of the day that's that's kind of where we need to go you yeah, know you guys know what you're doing at this point you know you and your things are on point that's it. That's all you got really at the end of the day, isn't it? Whether it's, uh, you know, I mean, it's even with any job type scenario, if you like, I'm not calling Marcus your boss, but I know what you're saying. Okay. You've yeah, got to have a relationship yeah. that feels comfortable and and one that you don't necessarily have to work at because it's just too fucking difficult otherwise, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Um, just to go back to uh, like the songwriting side of things. Um I, I sort of have mentioned it in passing, but I, I, you're one of the few bands. I'm a musician, but uh, I, I really struggle with the time signatures you guys do, just playing along to them a lot of the time. It's uh, it's very difficult unless I think you're natively, un, you're a bit of a, you guys are mathematicians in so many ways. But uh, look, this is your ninth album. And mm -hmm. are, you, are you at a point where things, do they just happen in the studio between yourself and Fred? Like, do you, do you lay down a groove or does he lay down a, a riff and it sort of just seamlessly interlocks or do you still really have to work at things in order for them to sound as cohesive? And that's the key word, as cohesive as they do. Yeah, no, it doesn't happen like that at all. I mean, we, we don't, we don't jam up one single riff and we haven't done in, in 20 years or more. I mean, when I joined the band already, they were using like Porta Studios and they were programming drums on, on Roland R5's mm -hmm. uh, machines. And, and it was all like built at home. And then once you kind of feel like you have a song, then you, we would bring it to the rehearsal and try to kind of emulate whatever it was, was, it was programmed. And that's continued ever since. It's just been easier and easier because then, of course, in the, by the mid nineties, you introduce computers a couple of years later, you introduce uh, music software uh and stuff where you can just program every you don't even need the drum machine anymore you can just program in the actual uh, software and stuff and 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 so this band is the, in, in a lot of ways uh it's a result of the tool that we had uh at hand and uh, it's continued to be like that so there's not initially with every song there's nothing um what do you what do you call it like it's not um it doesn't it doesn't come from us as a band it's just the one guy's idea and you start messing with it mm -hmm. you start programming drums and 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 that's still how we work and uh and and frederick as far as the songwriter he, he really hasn't been a, uh, doing so much of the songwriting aspect in in quite a while now i mean mm -hmm. he wrote uh he wrote uh, his demon's name the demon's name is surveillance on coloss and then he helped figure out a few songs like Swarm. He helped, you know, we were actually in the rehearsal room and try to kind of figure out what changes we needed, we needed to do to that one. And I Am Colossus and the song Marrow. Mm -hmm. uh, but other than that, then for Violent Sleep, he didn't write any of the music for Violent Sleep and he didn't write anything for this one either. And he, he wasn't in the studio. He didn't, it's all Morton uh guitar playing wise on this album is all it's all Morton except for four solos uh okay and then, yeah so Frederick laid down four leads but all the guitar melodies and stuff and I know that uh, a lot of people so far and the interviews that we've done for this album have gotten that completely wrong they think that every guitar melody is Frederick no it's only it's only the leads and the rest so in other words, 99% of the guitar work on the album is Morton uh, and he mm -hmm. does all the melodies and all those things. And, and even on, they move below what sounds like kind of like a guitar solo that's Morton as well. But Frederick did lay down four, four leads for the album, which we were stoked about. 
because Frederick does have a very signature style, you know, as a lead guitarist. So it was important to us. And I think it's important to the fans that he is on the album and, and he is coming back to play with us, you know, live as well. But, but there has been some, some, uh, there has been some, I don't know if it's miscommunication or just people, I think, uh, per automatic think that that frederick is has been a lot more involved than he actually has but i will yeah. say for violent for violent sleep of reason for example, frederick did re, um, record a lot of the guitars for that album uh most of the better chunks of the guitars uh, on violent sleep he recorded the guitars he did not write the music but he recorded the guitars on this album he did not write any music and he didn't play much of the guitars only the four leads on top of all the guitar work that was already there so to speak mm. because yeah, he's was... very he, yeah he's very busy uh he he built a studio and that took like three years instead of one year and it's it's become like a very popular you know studio as far as so i think it's it, it became a monster both constructing it and building it and 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 then how popular it got and he and daniel bergstrand is working out of that studio now too so it also is crowded a lot of times with bands and stuff which is a good thing business-wise but it also i think that he thought that maybe he would get some more alone time there to like focus on his like solo next solo album and stuff and i think it's just been kind of instead it's just become work you know for good and bad obviously i think he enjoys it too but but so that's ha that's kind of been his focus uh since since he kind of stepped off there for a hiatus of, about like i don't know four years ago whatever it was five years ago but yeah he's the idea is at least he's coming back now and he seems pretty stoked about it you know he's he's been away now for for a good while and i think he he feels ready to kind of come back and and do that yeah, thanks for sharing that, actually, because you, you're one of the few bands out there where the guitarist and the drummer are the most public and identifiable face of the group. And, <coughs> excuse me, sorry. <coughs> but and, and what I mean by that is, um, you know, fa fans fans don't know, you know, they don't get it. I mean, I'm a fan, don't get me wrong, but they don't get the opportunity to talk to people the way that I am, if you like. So they draw their own conclusions. And uh, yeah. I'm, sh I'm sure you know that that you yourself and Frederick, um, I mean, go on to any YouTube Go into a YouTube video of a live performance of you guys and have a look at the comments. The comments are going to be about yourself and Fred. It's just how it is, okay? But the the I mean, fans don't necessarily understand that people get human too. <laughs> Surprise! Yeah. And you move and you groove and you've got a different dynamic and that dynamic changes over time. And it's really cool to hear that um, whilst Frederick is doing his thing, that you've got another killer guitarist in the group who can step up and produce music, which sounds there's no change. Yeah, I mean, he de Morton definitely writes uh, music that is different from uh, Frederick's stuff, but it's still within kind of uh, within the confines of what makes uh, Meshuggah, you know, so mm. it's, and, and kind of as long as we're using the same sound and we're going for the same kind of approach, it's all going to sound like like true Meshuggah stuff. Uh, yeah. But but I will say that uh, that uh, Morton stuff is usually a little more, maybe a little more visceral and maybe not so necessarily as advanced rhythmically, but more he's going for gut feeling and like so his his songs are a little more like you feel them. So like ligature marks, for example, so it has like a directed like it has a directness about it that mm -hmm. that that I really like. Uh, whereas you take a, a, some songs that we've made over the years that are a little more uh, blue and brainy, if you will, you know, uh, that that is also cool. And it's a, it's an important aspect of our band that you have those two different kind of approaches. So you take Bleed, for example, it's written by Frederick, very blue, very brainy song. Mm -hmm. And then you take something like like ligature marks is more like nutsack and viscera which is more than more if you to make it it's not that you know black and white all the time sometimes they kind of intersect more as far as like what kind of stuff they write but they, they, it, it is a little frustrating sometimes uh, even though i'm just a drummer so i'm looking in at other people's comments but but i mean if you even if you go back all the way to like 
nothing album. So we're talking 20 years. Uh, Morton has been the biggest songwriter in the band since then. He has written on his own more tracks than anyone else has ever written in this band. So he yeah. has actually been, if you will, the main songwriter, even though, of course, you know, me and Dick have worked together on a lot of songs, especially on Violent Sleep. We had maybe the bigger part of the album, uh, but that's me and him together. So if you take person by person, Morton has by far written more than anyone else in the band over the last 20 years, at least. Hmm. So and, and that's and that gets overlooked a lot. And it's a little sad. You know, he doesn't really care. He, he's not he's not looking for fame and glory in that regard. But hmm. it's still like, come on, man, credit where credit's due. So so it, it's it's it, it's a little bit annoying sometimes when it's like, oh, come on, people get your facts straight. You know, <laughs> he's yeah. uh, he, he's Malcolm to the Angus Young, if you know what I'm saying. Yeah, yeah, pretty much. Yeah. 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 The bedrock, the bedrock. Yeah. Now. Mm-hmm. We, 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 I've hinted at this, but I'll, I'll go there with this one here because I think it's important. You know, we, with a career as impressive and as critically acclaimed as yours, you're one of the few bands who has an equal amount of critical acclaim as you do fandom, if you like. At, at this point, the group is universally regarded as the flag bearer of the union between uh, technical proficiency, crushing heaviness. Um, but something else, you've always carried yourself without any pretension. You are the people's band in, in many ways. So could you single out any aspect of your career within the band that you would say is the most special or significant? I mean, there's so there are so many things that that kind of paved the way for us, as it were, and in, in, in regards to like, it's not just a matter of, of being, you know, a band that finds their own sound or being whether you're you're good musicians or you're this or that or uh, you have to have luck and timing and stuff like that. So if anything that th- those things have there's plenty of awesome fucking bands that are still in garages and we all know that and they will never get out of the garage Hmm. but there there has to be some things that of course we started early it was a different time altogether in 1990 you know um extremely different times extremely different music what was around you know you had obviously the big bands and you had some death metal and stuff and you and you had pantera and you had bands like that but at compared to now metal now is this enormous vista that is just never ending and and there's what can be included in in that array is pretty much basically anything at this point so very different world but then we had we released uh destroyer race improving 1995 there was some some yeah, emi or sony boss or something like that heard it and really liked daniel bergstrand's production for it it opened like a door to this to that and that made us uh kind of i think made us get the machine head in europe tour that we were out mm-hmm. with them for like 10 weeks and they were huge with their first album burn my eyes in europe they were really huge uh so so that was a good like opening the market in europe for us we got to play for for thousands and thousands of people obviously and and so we've had these those like things that kind of opened doors for us and and then we got the slayer tour in the us in 99 which opened kind of the us market to us and made some guys um uh, you know of, of of tool recognize us and they wanted to bring us on tour so then we went on 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 tour with tool and that gave us kind of the Ausfest gig which and then you know it's so <laughs> timing and luck is also like a, a big a big portion of of it and when you when you i i have i kind of tend to go back to what you said like the people's the the the, the people's band in a way and it I think we've always we've always kind of looked at at what we do and and ourselves as as people as musicians and we we've always been kind of humble about that or we try to be you know and 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 that's kind of what we grew up with too it's it's quite a common thing actually in Sweden it's something we call Jan Telogen and 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 the further north you go in Sweden you will you will kind of see that people are like that and you're kind of 
during your upbringing, you get told over and over again, you don't think you are any, don't think you're hot shit, you know, like just, you know, do your thing. And even Peter Forsberg, one of the most famous hockey players on the planet was always extremely like kind of humble about like, no, I'm, I'm not, I don't really, yeah, I can, I guess on a good day, I can, I can, you know, <laughs> I can eat a pack of casually. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But that's, that was always his approach. And, and he comes from the same town as, as me and Morton and, and, so there's something that that to be said about that too, like your upbringing, kind of where we come from, the area that we come from, and that's kind of always been infused in us, I think. And and we've always tried to really remain like, just you know, don't don't we're, we never let any of this get to our heads because we also we're very aware that it could also end just like that for one of us getting sick or something happening or some this or that so yeah we've always had kind of a cautious approach as far as to like yeah we're the shit we're the best we're the you know we, we've never really seen ourselves like that you know mm -hmm. it, it's just we we were lucky enough to have to find each other as people and as musicians at a time that we did uh, because it was the early nineties and, and there wasn't much, there wasn't many drummers around that could blood, play double bass. So they, Meshuga, the old drummer left. He was an extremely good, way better drummer than I was when I joined Meshuga. So they had to really, they had to kind of make do, <laughs> if you will, with the, with the, with the worst drummer, but they, there was not many drummers around, you know, that could, that could play double bass and stuff. And, so so I kind of got the chance and I really worked hard at it and, and it kind of gelled after a year or two. We kind of felt good about it. And 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 but it's always been it's 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 never been about like. In the music, it might come out like we, we always like had something to prove or that we were trying to, you know, express our um, diversity as musicians and the, all the things that we can do and look this is so complex look he can play equally with left and right hand or whatever it might be that has never been an issue we've always kind of just this music sound sounds so cool that sounds amazing but how the hell am i going to be able to play that and then you somehow you're able to learn how to play it and it's like oh that's cool but it, it's never really been that about about something that was fake it was always about something genuine we really just always loved how this kind of music that we then tended to write over the years how that sounded you know mm. and that started that started early i mean already when i joined the band they were already kind of set on a course that was mm -hmm. this kind of lateral move away from from back then what was considered like mainstream you know whether that be you know, Testament or Metallica or, or Pantera or Death or whatever was around. We just wanted to do something else, you know? Yeah. Yeah. No, fair enough. Yeah. And it's, it's worked. It's definitely worked. And look, as a, you know, being the people's band, do you feel the burden of expectation from fans at this point? Because it sounds like you do go onto the, the YouTube, you go onto YouTube and you read comments and the like, and, but do you, do you feel as though, um, you've got to deliver for fans at this point? Uh, I mean, we definitely want to, but at the same time, we can't, we can't really have that be any kind of crucial aspect uh, while we're trying to create new material. I don't think we really think about that. I will say this though. I, I don't know if it's impossible to keep that out completely. I mean, if you if you even have that in your brain, it's going to be there whether you uh, accept that or not, and whether you say that out loud that that you write for other than yourselves. But we do mm -hmm. we do really try to just write for ourselves and whatever we think sounds cool. And at this point, we be we believe enough in ourselves that if we think it sounds cool, we are pretty sure that the fans will dig it too. But but of course, it, there's you, you as a band. I think you always should continue to worry whether other people think you're still doing something cool or whether they think it's shit. You know, mm. because sometimes mm. I think having been this band for so long, the, the 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 longer you've been in it, the more you're kind of in a bubble. And 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 yes, you do get to see and uh, appreciate and sh and 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 take in uh the 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 whatever 
the comments, the accolades, whatever they are, but mm. there's always mm. also, uh, you know, another side of things. There's always people that are not going to like this kind of music. We fully accept that. Of course, it's not for everyone, uh, but but you do have all those things that 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 of course is there for you to use as a motor, as a drive for you to keep going. So it, it wouldn't be fair to say that it's something we completely dis disregard or discard as far as like fans opinion of our music, but, but it's more after the fact than, than, than during whatever the, the creative process that we try to, where we try to really kind of lock ourselves in and kind of just be focused on, on what we're doing, you mm. know? Yeah, that definitely comes across. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think fans, real fans, are with you for the journey, and uh, people on the periphery sort of dip in and out. But that's just how things go. So, hey, look, uh, am I, have I got a bit more time for a couple more questions? Is that cool, or have you got to go to the next one or do something else? Or no, no, no. It's, it's all good, man. Um, have you thought about doing a project with Jess? Uh, has she ever tried to get you to fill in in Bruharia? Uh, no, not not Brueria, but we have talked about this for years, like trying to do something. And it's I'm I'm sorry to say, but I'm the procrastinator, and I, I'm the reason why <laughs> nothing ever happens. She 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 always has a bunch of great ideas, and she wants to record stuff. And, and whether it's you know it doesn't even matter whether it turns out good or not, it's just like a fun thing to do. And I I'm gonna have to shape up on that and got like get everything going because even for a few years i haven't even gotten the the, the cubase on this workstation at home to work mm -hmm. and i just at some point i just gave up and then you have the band and then we were writing for a year and a half in the band and then you don't want to come home and like put on cubase at home and then you're just your brain is kind of fried and but but she, she she's like she's rooting for us already even though we never <laughs> wrote anything yet but she's like yeah i'm, I'm the i'm the i'm the the kind of the the brake pad in this regard i'm sorry to say mm. i'll come out whenever it comes out mate you know you've, you're busy and i know she is too so uh it's one of those things we can look forward to maybe in a decade's time or so <laughs> yeah 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 <laughs> you know what, what about um you worked with one of my favorite musicians of all time recently trace bruins from mr bungle and uh, Faith No More. You worked with him recently on the Imperial Triumphant album, if I'm if I'm not mistaken. Oh, if, that that is giving me way too much credit. I, I did not work with him. I did not meet him. Uh, I uh, was only we had a session one day where where Kenny Grahowski, the drummer, invited me to to play taiko drums in Brooklyn, and I'd never I'd never played taiko drums before. Uh, and I had really had no idea what I was doing. I was playing it all wrong, but, <laughs> but it was a fun day and they recorded a bunch of it. And some of, some of whatever that session was ended up on their album, but, but I, I deserve absolutely no credit for any of that. That was just, uh, like three hours of fun playing taiko drums and they recorded it. And that was my whole involvement in it. So mm -hmm. I would love to hear you yeah. do something with Trace Bruins and, uh, Trevor Dunn, the bassist from Mr. Bungle as well. That would be an unreal trick. Oh, to Mr. Bungle, man, they were actually, it's what it's, it's annoying. Like your brain sometimes, cause we do so much interviews now, especially of course, right. These last few weeks when you have mm -hmm. an, a new album coming out and, and uh, there's so many bands that you want to mention. There's so many bands that you forget all the time because you tend to mention kind of the metal bands or, or like some old, really like what we grew up with, like uh, Rush and, and Marillion and, 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 uh, you know, Judas mm -hmm. Priest and, and Black Sabbath and all that stuff. But you forget like the really kind of super crucial years it, for me, I think was from, I was like 17, 18 to like maybe 22, 23, like right around the time before and after I joined the band, like the, the a couple of years before and after. And I listened so much to like Mr. Bungle back then and, and Primus uh, and bands like that, 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 mm. and that I usually fail to mention, you know, and Pantera as well. Pantera had a huge impact on us, like early nineties as a band, they, cause they were kind of the only kind of metal band that was still kind of going yeah. strong during all that grunge stuff, you know, cause mm. I mean, you had the big ones, you had Metallica, obviously 91 black album, of course they were always huge, but when you, when you go down like one level, there, there was not so much happening cause grunge kind of took over everything. And, and we sure enjoyed grunge too, you know, don't get me wrong. I listened the hell out of Alice in Chains and, and, and stuff like that and Nirvana and, 
and 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 those are yet even more bands that i i always fail to mention you know because you you tend to like yeah what metal bands do we listen to oh yeah that's and you tend to kind of forget all those like kind of quirky bands and and dead can dance and stuff like that like i listened to to a lot of like weird stuff back then you know even even weird bands like 13th floor elevators and 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 um like um yeah you see yeah, cool there's stuff, my yeah. brain again so on on a daily basis when you're trying to like kind of give something back to those bands where that, that you kind of were inspired by as a as a young and you kind of just you just kind of at a loss and you're mm. like oh black sabbath that's <laughs> one and then you're like stuck you know it's that's yeah. a bummer i need to start making lists that i can just read off a list oh yeah this band and this band because uh, I, I do feel like sometimes that when you, especially when you do like big important interviews and stuff, and then and then you don't give kind of credit where credits due, and then some of those bands really meant a lot to us, you know, as mm. as as who we were and and for the age that we were in. And I know that Frederick and Jens, for example, and and the the also the original bass player Peter Norton, that the that was the setting when I joined the band. Um, they they listened to so much to um holy moses this german band yeah i know them. yeah and, and uh, their early stuff like new machine of Liechtenstein and uh, finished with the dogs those two albums and it was crazy and that they took actually a lot of the early mashuga stuff like as far as the drumming and the kind of some of the stuff is really kind of uh, uh, almost like a, a a page out of their book you know ripped straight out and put to use you know so so and, and that's another band that that you know you fail to it's like oh trying to think of bands but but you know holy moses is one of those bands that just never pop into my brain so i'm glad i'm here to get to tell you at least <laughs> yeah and and look you have given some props to tim alexander in other interviews that i've listened to recently yes. as well which yes. is very 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 cool because he's he's one of those drummers that um i mean he's worked with alex skolnick from testament he's um he's he can almost do anything but people don't know about him or people don't talk about him. So I'm really glad a drummer of your stature or of note has actually given him some props. Oh yeah. I, w I mean, I would not be the, 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 the drummer that I am today if it wasn't for, for Tim Alexander and Primus. He had a huge impact on me, you know, that definitely for sure. hundred percent. Mm. Australia. Uh, you, I, I watched your last gig, uh, your last tour down here. I watched it at uh, the Tivoli in Brisbane and holy shit. I think I wrote a review about that one there and it ended up going viral, not viral, but, you know, and then getting shared across some things. And I think I said something to the effect of um, the uh, s structural engineers will need to be called in to assess the foundations of the building after you guys have left, you know, such was the crushing <laughs> performance. Yeah. Yeah, that's <laughs> a good one. <laughs> yeah, I think that was a line that got singled out and got shared. But um, look, it, it was an almighty performance. And even uh, what's the band that went on before you? Thy Art is Murder. CJ yeah. Mann. CJ Mann beforehand. What did he say? He said something along the lines of, Look, when they when we were offered the Meshuggah spot, it was like we were really excited, but then we realized that we were going on before Meshuggah. <laughs> so, <laughs> meaning it's a hard act, it's a hard act to sort of go, oh shit, we've got to warm the fans up and the like. But it all alludes to something else. So okay. Um, I feel like as though you're a special band for Australian fans. Do you feel the same way? Yes. Yes, we've always felt that. I think we, and that's why we we are always asking our managers and bookers like when when what what is it looking like in australia when can we go there we, we do love coming there we do not uh, love the the flight and the jet lag that we have to deal with obviously but we do love the people we do love the vibe and we always enjoy ourselves down there and we do feel like we have a special connection with australian people maybe more than any other country or region in the world and, and with, nice. why that is I, I I don't know. Maybe because in a certain way, like Swedes are a little outsiders, and you're for sure outsiders, kind of mm. geographically in a sense. I don't know if that has anything to do with it, but we always felt very welcome there. There, and and we we are always we are, we're always jonesing to go there when we're when we're kind of in touring mode, and unfortunately. 
bookers, promoters, and that whole thing, it's not always like ideal. So sometimes uh, I know that we've had offers uh, that we had to decline because it wasn't like financially viable mm-hmm. to do it because we, we do bring all uh, these days, we don't hiring crew locally anymore. We have our set uh, crew. So we're basically 15 people traveling wherever we're going. And, mm-hmm. and we do bring all, a lot of gear. So it's shipping, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So it, it, at this point in time, we're, you're, you know, you're not just a band, but you're also a company and you have to try to run your company fairly as efficiently as you can. And that means sometimes we do end up in situations where we're like, oh man, what a fucking bummer because it just didn't make sense financially or whatever. But, yeah, you know, I, I think, I mean, for this one, we're obviously coming to Australia. There's no doubt about it, but, but, and we, and we have been for every album, I think for at least like the last four albums or so. Uh, and, and we're definitely looking forward to coming down there again. And we'll just do like we did last time. We flew in like a week before. So we had like a week off oh, nice. to try to yeah. kind of slowly, you know, kind of get out of the that jet lag because it, it, it really hits you like a hammer, man. There's no 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 joking, joking it away, you know, when you're kind yeah. of literally kind of as far as you can go from us and going eastward. Westward is always way easier, but eastward, uh, oh, man. Yeah, you lose it takes a day its plus. On you. Yeah. 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 And and just something else there too. I went through uni with a bunch of Swedes and it was really weird. We were so similar, meaning the Australians and the Swedes were so similar because you might know this, there are a bunch of Swedish people living in Australia these days. And yes, yeah, there's a, heap, a lot on the Gold Coast actually too. It's people move here from Sweden and they just don't leave. And and I think that's because there's, yeah, it's culturally, I get we're part of the Western hemisphere, but it's deeper than that. There's something else. And I think you might've touched on it there. We're slightly quirky in some respects, but I, I do think we, I do think I've noticed about the Scandinavian Swedish, Swedish people in particular, you're prepared to give people a chance like we are in Australia. You give people what, a, what I call a fair go. Yeah, that might be the case. And I think too, to a certain degree, I, uh, our sense of humor tend to kind of line up a lot too. Like mm. you guys are funny as hell. Like that's how we see you. At least we think Australians are, are, are uh, on average, uh, a very humoristic, uh, people and, and Swedes maybe are not seen as such, but once you get to know them a little bit, most Swedes are, have kind of a quirky dark mm-hmm. weird sense of humor and and uh and uh not that different from the brits and the british obviously you have something of of of, of mm-hmm. that obviously and and uh, uh, there's something that translates you know mm. yeah definitely yeah mate look i'll make this my last one for you but i need to know when is the book coming out because i'd love to read it oh man yeah that's a good idea, actually. There's oh, not even anything do it. in the plans. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. We got, yeah. I, I, someone actually asked Morton about this a few years back, or, or like, yeah, a few years back. And, and Morton's initial kind of response was to, no, why would we? We never did anything. Like, there was, there's <laughs> nothing to write about. And then you, and then his friend, a close friend who's very kind of, intimately almost familiar with what we've actually done over the last 20 years or so 30 years he like looked at Morton like what what the hell are you talking about you got this thing and that thing all the, the all these different things and Morton was like yeah yeah that's right maybe maybe there is a bunch of weird shit that's funny that we could write about and especially if you throw some extra salt on it too like like they all do like monthly crew i'm sure there's a little bit a heap of extra salt you put in there to kind of make everything a a little you know turn it up a peg or two just to make it even worse you know so kind of i guess you know we'll see we'll see but i i think that also it kind of ties in with the, with the, that what we were talking about earlier what we touched on like how you're a kind of a, a people's band and you're not mm. kind of seeing yourself as something spectacular in any way shape or form really you were just kind of a, a few guys that got lucky but but 
that kind of maybe ties into this too. I don't think any one of us like feels like, what do you mean? Like, why, why should any, why would anyone want to be interested in reading about us? You know, mm. but we'll see. We'll see. Mm. Well, I actually think you should come out with a book too, though. I mean, there's so many great stories out there. So I'm, I'm talking to a few people at the moment or talking to Cam Lee, for example. I mean, I'm just, as I say, I'm just talking, exploring the ideas at the moment about writing the books. So I write books, you see, and uh, there's just, there's hardly any metal books out there there's like half a dozen to a dozen out there you know there's max cavalera's rex from pantera's um but beyond that we don't really have as fans we don't really have uh your book to dive into and mate i'd read it and think a lot of people feel the same yeah maybe i'm gonna have to start you know, thinking about that shit yeah maybe well, max Moola on the side from the books <laughs> why not <laughs> why not and then you yeah. can do your speaking tours like what bloody scott ian did you know, it's, oh, all, it's, all, no. it's all there. <laughs> yeah, I don't know about that, man. Yeah, I don't know. They're, they're a bit full on those things. But I think the book the book is is a great idea. I think uh, the, the, the great thing about a book is your story. You can write it on a plane. You can write it anywhere. You just start it and then maybe in five years' time or whatever, you get to the end and you've got something resembling a manuscript and you can hand it over to a ghostwriter who can then just sort it all out and then give it back to you and then maybe it gets released. That's actually, sweet. yeah, yeah. Thanks for the hint and the nudge. <laughs> definitely. Yeah, yeah definitely. Right. Well, it's been, it's been a pleasure talking to you. Uh, you can tell uh, I'm an old school fan of the group. Uh, I've just so admired what you guys have done now for so long. And I just, I love this new album, by the way. I love that you're keeping it real. I love that there's no curveballs, that the whole band, through your career, you've just given it the way you feel like you need to give it to the people and we've just loved you for it. So congratulations on that front and hope to see you down here soon. Thanks, Andrew. I appreciate that. No worries, bro. All right. Have a great one. Thank you. Yeah, Thanks, you too. Gotcha. Sure. What a lovely fella. I do enjoy talking to the Swedes, I must confess, particularly those who are near to my vintage. Maybe even a bit older as Thomas alluded to there. Either way, what a killer chat. Now, before I let you go, I'm going to play a promo to do with my recently released book, Scars and Guitars, Volume 1. Any and all support is greatly appreciated. Here we go. This is Eric Rutan of Cannibal Corpse. You are listening to the Scars and Guitars podcast with Andrew McKay-Smith. I've been the host of the Scars and Guitars podcast since 2017. The first musician I interviewed for the show was David Vincent from Morbid Angel, and things have just snowballed from there. In all, I've posted almost 650 podcast episodes featuring conversations with many of the leading lights of rock, heavy metal, and beyond. It just got to a point where I thought, I need to write a book about all this, so that's exactly what I did. In Scars and Guitars Volume 1, you'll read a heap of deep reveals and commentary, such as Des Fafara talking about Cold Chamber and why the band will never return. You know, if you're a a band just starting out, you need to hear me. Do not start a band with partners. Ever. Yeah, wise words there. Sage advice, mate, for anybody. Don't ever, because I, I can't go do Cold Chamber right now unless I get others involved. Phil Anselmo talks about the episode in his career, which gives him the greatest sense of accomplishment. I think the staying power of the, the fans and the staying power of the I, of the songs, you know, whether it's Pantera, Down, or Super Joint, the fans remember the songs. Alex Skolnick from Testament confirms that, yes, playing the guitar in Ozzy's band is anything but an ordinary gig. Will Silent Oz from Demu Borgir write a book? Pa from Sabaton gives advice to people who want to start a band. Look at the team around you, look at the bandmates. If uh, if the guys want to be on the stage, then it's all cool. If the guys want to be backstage, then it's not going to be cool. Current and former members of Cradle of Filth discuss the band's seminal 90s material. Read about the reaction to George Lynch and Mark from Suicide Silence's comments when they throw shade at then-President Donald Trump. We have this idiotic monster, you know, this egotistical, self-aggrandizing, complete piece of shit in there. I, I, I just I just can't understand how we've gotten to this place. And yeah, we kicked a hornet's nest with Sepultura. Percussive overlord Gene Hoagland talks about recording with Chuck Schuldiner. Chuck was always 
um, you know, he was he was very you know very open minded and and he was into having his his musicians that were playing with him just reach out for for the best stuff that they had. Phil Campbell from Motorhead discusses what it takes to get sober. John Five answers his critics who dismiss his tenure with Marilyn Manson. You know, my name is John Five and Manson gave me that name and um, I had some of the best years of my life in that band and, and learned a lot. And we get the lowdown on Trey Zagtoth from those who would know, including his mother. All across Scars and Guitars Volume 1, there are moments of tension, relief, tragedy, exhilaration, and throughout it all, you'll obtain insight that I believe no one else has managed to obtain from many of your favourite artists. So treat yourself. Scars and Guitars Volume 1 is currently available as an ebook with a print edition on the horizon. Follow the links attached and download a sample. I'm sure you'll be compelled to read the whole book.